Well, once again, you know what time it is. It's midweek manna time. And again, we are getting close to uh, finishing up our journey of the book of Acts. Uh, it is, of course, that very important uh, letter book in our New Testament. Again, it is really, um, I, I'd hate to put a figure on it, but I'm going to say at least 80% of church history is in this one letter alone because it was designed to do that. Most of the other letters that we have in the New Testament, uh, especially written by Paul, uh, were instructional, um, uh, giving strength to local congregations, helping them mature, helping them to discipline, uh, helping them to navigate with the gifts that were new to them because that's what the spirit life brings to us. Uh, however, this letter, uh, again, as we've shared multiple times and will continue to until we finish the study, is, is because there's new listeners or maybe you haven't been uh, following for uh, maybe the last couple times together. We just understand that this letter was constructed um, to give information, a historical record, really of two things. I've, I've continued to bring out the first one, and that is uh, the work of Christianity from its inception. Uh, of course, the foundation is Judaism, um, and we know the work Jesus came unto his own. However, he talked to his disciples, and he said, I'm sending you into all the world. And uh, he said, that's why you have to tarry in Jerusalem in the upper room until you receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, because it was through that, that was the enabler, still is today, of helping us to understand the inspiration of God's Word and to own it uh, and to apply it to our lives. And from there, of course, the work of evangelism or the Great Commission of going into all the world. So again, Luke is the writer, and it's really not contested much at all. There's a, there's a few that would say it could have been somebody else, but we pretty much know uh, that it's Luke doing a continuum of the gospel of Luke, and it's written, again, to a, an individual by the name of Theophilus. And I've shared that enough, but the point we want to keep uh, in instructing ourselves, reminding ourselves, is that uh, whoever Theophilus was, um, they were in position. And so this is a, a historical record of how the work uh, of Christianity continued. The second thing uh, that he continues to come back, and, and it's, it's woven through the writing so much that if you don't draw attention to it, it just becomes that given. But again, we need to give allegiance to it in that it's also the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Um, and again, that is paramount to us. It's, so for us today, some 2,000 years later, it's important for us to have historical record, especially in an hour of a cancel culture that wants to eliminate anything historical. Um, it, it, it is really important for us to say, okay, I'm reading about a first century group why does that apply to me? Or I'm reading about um, the, the church, but their church and the way we operate church today seem to be eschewed from each other. Um, you know, the technologies that we have today, the mindsets that we have today. Uh, today, we know how Grace Life Church is, and any um, evangelical, especially spirit-filled Pentecostal-type church uh, we put a large emphasis upon singing and upon music and upon the arts. Um, we know they were singing back then, but we never get a feeling that there was performance music, uh, a music designed to inspire others to lead them. It was very congregational back then. They were singing the Psalms. Um, so that doesn't make them wrong. doesn't make us wrong. Uh, what I'm sharing is, again, that's why we can't afford to lose the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm taking a little time here this time to, to emphasize this, 
because it's so important to us. I, I was thinking the other day of ministers before me that, of course, uh, I was around and and got some some mentorship, some tutelage from. Um, and honestly, the way the country was at that time, a local pastor preached the gospel and made hospital visits. There was very little counsel given. There was some instruction given, and, and most ministers saw that, well, we're doing that, uh, of course, in our Sunday school classes. Um, in my time, we still embraced those things, and yet the responsibility of counseling uh, has become paramount because, again, of the culture. And then we added, and here's the ugly word, doesn't have to be ugly. Um, here we are talking about entertainment factor. And the truth is we all like to have fun and we all like to be inspired and we all like to have something that, now that really got my attention, whether it's musically or again, the arts, whatever it is. Um, so we've got more than, than two balls that we're juggling here. We've got multiple. And the reason we're doing our studies like we are is we cannot afford to lose what has been given to us, even though we have other things that we have been blessed to receive. So you have to balance them. So with that said, let's go into our reading. Today's reading is going to be a little different. We're in chapter 23, and I may do a lot of reading and then come back with most of the commentary uh, as a conclusion today because you're going to you're going to see where we are again. So let's let's focus now. We've seen the work out of Jerusalem. We see it's strictly among the Jews, and then a few Gentiles were in Antioch, and now. We're multiple years into it, 25 years into this writing uh, of the historical overview. Uh, and we see now that uh, the, the main focus is on Paul. Um, again, we've, we've brought out other names that were still no names to us, which inspires us today to say, hey, they're in God's record. And, and that's the way he looks at us today. It doesn't make us a nobody. But not everybody aspires to be a Paul, especially a Paul, who obviously was formed and, uh, by God himself, shaped to do this initial work um, of branching over into the Gentile word with the gospel. Uh, and so, Paul, 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 Paul. And today, chapter 23, uh, we, we know up until now he's been having skirmishes, he's had hecklers, he's been abused. Uh, there's been plots to his life, but now it becomes major focus. I mean, he is on the post office wall of every community he's going into. Uh, this is a criminal, and uh, it's almost the wild, wild west now of um, dead or alive reward. And we'd rather him be dead than alive. I mean, and that's no joke. So let's go to chapter 23. I want to read the first 10 verses, and we're going to start seeing Paul's actual strategy. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you. I got to pause there. So this isn't some little tit for tat and uh, uh, you call me a name, I'm going to call you a name. Um, these are pivotal positions. So again, there's a strategy here by Paul. Paul knew who Ananias was, even though it says that he didn't know him. Look at the strategy. So verse three again. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. That doesn't sound like an ugly rebuke, but we're going to bring out why that's big. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. In other words, you have step, overstepped the boundaries. Verse 4, those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, 
that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, no, nor an angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose. I mean, you can hear it now, right? And some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. I mean, it's getting fever pitch now. We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? Oh, man, that really lathered it up. Verse 10, And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. So, this thing's heating up. And uh, we see he's there in Jerusalem. And, and, and I want to bring out one thing. This is the same city, the same place that the gift, the promise, the endowment of the Holy Spirit initiated in, in this pivotal way. We know the Holy Spirit's always been working the lives. We can look back to Noah. We can look to Moses. We can see that. But now this this new dispensation, this outpouring of the Spirit. And yet look at the same city, the hatred. That ought to speak to us, and I want to bring it in, in commentary. So we see now that he's in this council. We understand that the Sanhedrin's there. That means 72. And so this is your Supreme Court. Uh, and here they are, and of course they have section this thing now that there is an assembly there that uh, uh, shows respect to all the different uh, factions uh, they represent. And of course, we don't hear the name Essenes there, uh, or some other names like that, but these two very large, <laughs> and you'll almost laugh, parties, you, you read the word party, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Does it sound familiar today to, to us at all? With very partisan positions. And so as Paul gets there, I mean, he's ordered to be struck. And Paul fires back. And then, of course, when the high priest takes his position, being high and mighty and above the law, Paul calls him out on it. And you're, you're going to accuse me of breaking the law when you just did that? Well, that, I mean, that fired him up. And he makes a statement that, he, oh, I didn't know. I mean, that's, that's really in a position of, of satire. I didn't recognize him to be a high priest acting the way that he was. But he knew who Ananias was. And so we see this, this, this fevered pitch, and it just kept going. Well, Paul knew that he was outnumbered, and he knew literally his life was on the line. So he immediately speaks up and said, oh, yeah, I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee of, of the Pharisees. I'm, I'm a, in a lineage of Pharisees. And, yes, I'm here because of this position, this hope of the resurrection. Oh, man. The Sadducees are incensed by now. And, of course, the Scripture already bore out. And, again, remember, it's a historical record, so Theophilus will understand the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, and yet the war that's going on from the enemy to stop the work of God. And it shows up in people, right? And, of course, we have this big image here. In this, we see 
that uh, the, the scriptures bear out. The Sadducees did not believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection of that. They didn't believe in, in, in a spiritual world at all. It was all natural. And when you're dead, you're just, your body just goes back to the worms, and it's done. It's over. It's finished. Uh, of course, the old joke is they were known as Sadducees because they didn't believe in a resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. It's an easy way to remember the difference of the groups. The Pharisees, of course, also kept the law uh, to its uh, extent. However, they believed in a resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in these things. So Paul knew exactly what he was doing. And now they're fighting each other, and he's able to slip back in the shadows for a moment until now it's just it's getting uglier and uglier. And so the Romans, of course, have to step in uh, because they've got to keep order. It's all about the law uh, of order for them. So see, there's actually three groups in the room uh, that's going on. We don't really hear anybody uh, taking Paul's side in this. It, it, I mean, it, the, the room's divided against itself. Um, and, of course, it goes on. But I want to bring out this, you know, if, if you had just been hit in the mouth and you come back and you're going to call somebody uh, a sarcastic term or an ugly word, we probably wouldn't come up with whitewashed wall. I mean, that sounds too pale. However, he couldn't have been more insulting because what he was talking about was a white-washed sepulcher, a white-washed tomb. And the reason the whitewashing comes in to, why didn't he just call them, you know, uh, a, a tomb of old bones? Because it was part of the law, whether uh, more Pharisee than Sadducee, however, it's still the law, that you couldn't be defiled. And so walking by a tomb, and of course, that area was laced with them. If you go to uh, old Jerusalem today, you're, you, you will see throughout the Kidron Valley, because of Christian tradition, and Jewish tradition, uh, and of course the return of the Lord, that whole valley is filled with tombs. Not to mention all the caverns, uh, just like what Jesus' body was put into uh, temporarily. The whole region is laced with limestone tombs, uh, caverns, caves. The story of of uh, the road to Jericho and the Good Samaritan. That, that's where the thieves were hiding out. Uh, when we hear about the shepherds and their fold watching their sheep by night, uh, if you'll go to Jerusalem, uh, you will see it. And uh, they, would, they would move their sheep into a large cave for the night, and the shepherd would sleep at the opening of that cave. That way, it was one way in, one way out. That's why Jesus would come back, I'm the Good Shepherd. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Again, he wasn't just trying to be eloquent. He was speaking language that they understood. So back to whitewashed tomb. He said, uh, yeah, you need to be marked. So if, if a body had just been put into a tomb to uh, give it a, a sign of demarcation, they would whitewash it and it would have a glaring effect, right? And as you're walking by that cemetery, it's like, oh, you can't go there. We're going to take extra steps because we can't take a chance to be defiled. Now you see how insulting Paul was calling the high priest out. You know, not only are you dead, but you are a defilement. Wow. What blasphemous words, terms, visual Paul used. And uh, I, we can't afford to be around you. That's how revolting you are. Uh, and, of course, if a person, back to the story of the Good Samaritan, this is why uh, the priest, you know, went by 
that day. The rabbi went by that day. And we we got to cross the other side of the street. We can't afford, by law, if we get contaminated, there is this whole process of being cleansed. And I'm just too busy in life to go through all that. Plus, I don't want the image of that. I don't want people putting me on social media <laughs> and, uh, uh, and talking about how defiled I became because I touched a dead body. So back to here, you you are a, a whitewashed tomb. Uh, one other interesting point is um, I had the privilege, and we're getting ready to read about uh, Caesarea. Uh, we were there. And uh, when you see the, the, the ruins of that uh, major coastal city at one time, uh, what really stands out to you, again, are the sarcophaguses. And what does the word sarcophagus mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Sarcophagus means flesh eater. And what they were doing is building these crypts, uh, they look, we're used to caskets going in a vault in the ground. These um, uh, uh, limestone uh, sarcophaguses uh, were shaped just the way you can image, like a big long box, rectangular box. Uh, in other words, it looked more like what our vaults are, not a casket, but a vault, because they would put the body without embalming, of course, in there and close it up. Well, the limestone uh, had that agent in it that would just eat the flesh, and then eventually what you've got left is just a real good, clean skeleton. And so, again, I know it's a little more history, but it gives this imagery of what Paul was really saying. You are a whitewashed sepulcher. You are a defilement, and we're marking you out on it. And on top of that, you're just decaying. You have a purpose. You just kill. So what a statement. Let's go on now uh, to verses 11 through 24. So the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage. Notice it's written in red in your Bibles. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. So Paul knew he was going to survive Jerusalem. Remember again, all the prophecies uh, that people were saying, uh, warning him, you're going to go through great heartache there. You're, you're going to go through physical pain there. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's foreboding what's going on here, but I've, I've got to get there. I've got to get to Jerusalem. Now he's hearing by the Lord himself, by the Spirit. You've testified of me here. You've also got to do it in Rome, okay? Verse 12, uh, when it was day, the Jews made a plot. Now, pay real close attention here. The Jews, again, we keep hearing about the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat or drink till they had killed Paul. There were uh, more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now, the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand. Again, this is a Roman, right? And going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them. For more than 40 
of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they've killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready. Hmm. Look at the math here. 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. That's 470 to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night, which would be what? 9 p.m. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. So again, uh, uh, we're going to give most of the commentary as we finish reading here in just a moment. But what we want to bring out at this moment is now notice um, the fist of cuffs that's going on. Paul is removed because the Pharisees and Sadducees are so lathered up and they're, they're getting, they're going to go ahead and kill him now. He is removed to the barracks. And now 40, uh, 40 plus, uh, get with the high priest. We've got a plan. We want you to initiate it. We're going to do you a big favor. We're going to take this guy out. So here's the plan. It'll look harmless as you're leading him down so that you said, I want to inquire more about what went on yesterday. He'll never get to you. We're going to kill him. Insomuch that they were fasting, even water, not just the food. This is how serious we are. We're not going to eat. We're not going to drink till we get this done. So you can see now it's to a boiling point, a flash point. They are, they are livid. They are done. So again, all these writings that we've had coming up in this letter of history, we see as the gospel is going out to the Gentiles more and more and getting into Asia and that, that, that there's been a, a collection of Jews about if, if, if there's miracles and healings going on, salvations in this city, then there's always a remnant of Jews that uh, we, we don't like this at all. We're opposed that would go to the next city that Paul had set up and would come and try to heck on and to disrupt. Now he's come all the way back to Jerusalem. They, they can't believe it. This is great. He's coming right where we want him. We've got the trap set. We're going to take him out. Uh, I'll make other comments uh, as we finish reading here. So let's go now and finish out through verse 35. So Claudia, and again, let me read 25 again. And, and he wrote a letter to this effect. Okay. So Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death nor imprisonment. This is a Roman writing this. He has no dog in the hunt, right? He has no skin in the game. Verse 30, and when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. And when they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. And on reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. So obviously, we're putting it on pause, and the next time together, we will go on about what's happening there in Caesarea. 
However, to finish out the study this time, so now we see what's going on. Uh, uh, they mean to kill him. And so literally the Romans got to keep order. And as we just did that quick math, 470 soldiers. Can you, can you imagine that today? Can you imagine the budget? Can you imagine uh, in, any military or police institution that would have to put that many uh, people on the, on the pay scale, uh, on the, uh, a plan to protect in, in an entourage traveling, in this case, 60 miles. And here they are, uh, the, the image of it. So again, they'd already heard that there was a group out to kill him, uh, but they knew that they had far outnumbered uh, the numbers that they had heard. They've got to protect, they can't afford to allow this guy to be killed by them because he's a Roman citizen. And so now he has to go to Felix in Caesarea. So again, remember the language of the Bible. We're always going up to Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem is in the southern part of Israel, right? But it's always the elevation, as the psalmist said. Uh, of course, it's the holy city. So to give it homage, uh, you're always talking about going up to Jerusalem. In this case, they're traveling northward from Jerusalem to Caesarea, which is, of course, part of the Galilee uh, region, and it's coastal. It's uh, closer to Mount Carmel. Of course, we, we know the story of what happened there with Elijah. And as they're on the coast, now he's taken to Felix. What we also need to know just historically before we get into the spiritual side of this and finish up is that uh, the, the government seat was not Jerusalem for the Romans. It was Caesarea. Again, Caesarea. So this whole area was developed uh, by the Romans. And so they have their amphitheaters there. They have their hippodrome there. Uh, the, the, the ruins are still there. The, the, the fabulous aqueduct uh, that, that gives water into all the uh, many thousands that would have been living there at that time, those ruins are still there. And so what I want to bring out here now is he is taken to Felix. This letter has been written, of course, from Jerusalem uh, to be carried by uh, this entourage of Roman soldiers to be given to Felix, and now it's read. And now you, you notice he did not embellish any part of the story. This is exactly what happened. He's a Roman citizen. So if that's Felix's first question. So what province are you from? I'm from Cilicia. Oh, okay, yeah, that's part of our uh, world. So yes, I, I will give you a hearing. And that's where we've put it on pause. Uh, again, uh, the praetorium that's listed here is the governor's residence. Uh, and the ruins of it is still, oh my goodness, it's right, uh, you talk about scenic, you talking about amazing. So uh, here's, the, here's the aqueduct right on the coast and then this large amphitheater, and then the praetorium, and then the hippodrome. If you ever watched the movie Ben-Hur, that kind of oblong arena. You know, we're big about our sports today, our coliseums, you know, our arenas to play our, uh, football and baseball and basketball. Uh, uh, the Romans were big on sports. And so this is all there, but that praetorium, this is where Paul would stay and he had to await his accusers coming uh, to hear. That's what part of the story we're in. So let's close out with this. We gotta talk about religious hate. I brought out a little bit about the same city that became the cradle of Pentecost is now the very same city that is just filled with hate. We understand Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. Now they mean to take Paul out. We've got to stop this work. This is a continuum of Jesus. Paul, of course, was a Jew, also a Roman citizen. I mean, he was fashioned for this work by God himself, trained by, at the feet of Gamaliel the brilliance of the man to start off with. 
I mean, we saw his strategy right there in the midst of this mob that had the authority, the religious authority. And again, we got to remember how Jerusalem was set up. You have the temple, not a church, the temple with the Holy of Holies established right there. But right on the grounds, looming over it, of course, you see the ruins of it today, still there, of course, was uh, the, the Roman fortress for all of uh, the, the Roman army. And so when you hear about barracks, that's where Paul was at this time. So it's a huge complex. And, and it's just this marriage of religiosity with, with army. And uh, they're going, the Romans are going to keep order. And so here we are now. Uh, we, again, we already know about Barabbas. We already know about what was happening years earlier with Jesus. And, and this letter probably was written around A.D. 63. So within the next decade and less, this city is going to be destroyed. So there was a Jewish revolt going on. We know that. Um, uh, and, of course, they weren't revolting because of Jesus. They're, they're revolting against the Roman government. So all these powers, it's a perfect storm. Now, taken up northward to Caesarea. Again, remember the Holy Spirit was poured out there initially, right, to the Gentiles. And this is where Peter would come back with report. These Gentiles received the the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like we did. I heard him speaking in tongues, just like us. This is the same city. So we're back to this religious hate statement. I've been preaching this gospel a long time now. now I've been in Pentecostal circles. And yes, I've never, I've never been persecuted like Paul. Now we go through persecutions. And you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a preacher to have hurt that happens in, in religious circles, Christian circles. People have different opinion. And then we start, okay, I'm, I'm going to put God's name on what we're doing. Well, we're going to put God's name on what we're doing. Now we got to fight. Well, who's right? Because they both, they both say that they're doing it for God's sake. Here we see this, this ugly imagery of religious hate. And I will tell you now in the spiritual realm, what does the Bible tell us? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We, I love that word wrestle according to Scripture. It's, it's, the, it's the better picture instead of we just fight and duke it out. That wrestling, it just gets the whole body involved. And, and typically a wrestling match goes on a lot longer than a boxing match. Uh, it isn't the KO. It isn't the knockout. It's just uh, the whole body getting ripped and torn and, 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 and worn out. And this is what we experience through spiritual warfare, at times intense spiritual warfare. We wrestle. Daniel, remember again, praying. Uh, and and uh, his prayers were delayed, what, by three weeks uh, because of spiritual warfare. So we go back to Paul's writing. Uh, as uh, we have in the book of Romans or the letter to the Romans. And he said what? Uh, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, height, the position that they take, or depth, the position that they take, or width or breadth. He's all that spiritual warfare language. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what we preached last Sunday, right? The power of good was here first, and it is greater than the power of evil. Evil is just the absence of good. So here we are here in this picture. Boiling point in Jerusalem. They shift it now. The Romans are involved. Felix is bound. So I'll conclude with this. Felix was not a nice man. Felix started out in life as a slave. He had a brother that got into power who was Nero's favorite. This is how Felix gets free and becomes a free man. 
But not only does he become a free man, he was such a manipulator. He gets involved with his brother and becomes a governor. Now, he was married more than once. And uh, it just so happened that his uh, first wife uh, was the granddaughter to Antony and, of course, Cleopatra. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? Well, his last wife was, of course, uh, Drusilla, who was the daughter of, of Herod uh, Agrippa I. There was more than one uh, Herod Agrippa. So, I mean, this dude knew how to marry. He knew clout. Um, and so a slave who, through manipulations, became a freed man who got into power as a governor, and he operated unscrupulously. I mean, just wickedly. This is who Paul is going before. Now, some of you are already students of the Word, and you remember Felix's statement that we're going to read as we continue next time. But this is the position. So Paul is filled with hate, but he has one thing going for him. And he heard his Lord already tell him, you've been faithful to the assignment, and you stayed the task here in Jerusalem, but you're also going to Rome. Well, Rome's that way, and you sent me to Caesarea, but he had to go to Caesarea first. And as speaks to us in our spiritual warfare, religious hate. I will tell you of all the religious things that you deal with, with vices, with seductions, persecutions, in my opinion, there's nothing uglier and meaner and nastier than religious spirits. I've seen them in church my whole life. They're ugly. They'll, they're div divisive and... Uh, They'll, they'll, they'll tear a congregation apart. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll ruin people, uh, uh, their, their personalities uh, on into their image, their reputations. So again, we're seeing uh, a religious arena filled with hate, but God has his hand on Paul. So that speaks to us as we close now. We face similar warfare, maybe not to the level that shows up in the natural, but it's every bit as real. Remember, God is greater. And again, we have historical record. God's going to get his way. So we got to stay in his will and, and be faithful to that. And even though we, we, we will suffer, we'll be, we will be pressed down, but we will not be crushed. Let's pray together. We thank you, our Lord, again, for your word. Uh, it, it is fun, and it, it prepares us uh, uh, to, to have position today to know the historical record that's in your eternal word. It, we're supposed to know it. You said study to show yourselves approved. Uh, be thoroughly furnished. Uh, but at the same time, we also understand the spiritual side of it, that's still speaking to us. And we may not go to a Caesarea, and we may not battle in Jerusalem, we may not do certain things, but we will battle in spiritual warfare. And we, we shouldn't be amazed that it shows up religiously at times. We have, we have your eternal word sharing that with us. So let us keep heart and not faint. I like the King James on that. And stay faithful to that which you've called us to. And in this hour, as much as you use Paul, we say, here we are, Lord, use us. Use us in our hour to be faithful to further this gospel as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until next time, keep them vibes good, okay? God bless you.